Greg, it's a it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Um, and let me just get a sense of the group. I always ask this: How many people are showing up to the Dallas Fed for the first time? Oh wow, that's fantastic! And how many have been here before? All right, but that's not bad. That's pretty good. Okay. So we keep. I was telling Greg as we were uh, talking this afternoon. We we want more and more people to come to the Dallas Fed. Bring your friends. Our job is to. Uh, open up the Fed to the community. We want to be a leading citizen in this community, so we're thrilled you're here, and, uh, and we're, we're thrilled to have an interesting evening. And I'm going to get right into it. So let's start. Let's, we'll go, we're going to go a little chronologically. We'll wind up with uh, talking about carbon tax. But uh, how did you become an economist? Well, how did you decide? The story actually involves a woman, as all good stories do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I went to college at Princeton uh, as an undergraduate, and I... I'd never taken an economics course. I didn't, hadn't intended on t majoring in economics. Um, but I started dating this young woman for my freshman year. And she was taking an economics course. <laughs> and so she would tell me about what she was learning. Um, and it seemed more interesting than anything I was learning in any of my courses. <laughs> and I was taking all these math courses. I was a math major. I wasn't, I, wasn't, I was learning I wasn't quite as good at math as I thought I was. Um, and her economics courses seemed really interesting. So the very next semester, I started taking economics courses. And um, just fell in love with the field. I mean, it was, just, it was an eye-opening experience. And did you have a role model? Uh, I know you work. You work well, with Martin Feldstein I, and well, lots I, I of have, great I, economists. I, I've worked with several really great economists. The first person I took my first economics course from was a guy named Harvey Rosen, um, who was an absolutely fantastic teacher and still is a fantastic teacher. Um, he uh, then hired me to be his research, research assistant after that freshman year, not because I knew much economics at that point, but because I knew some computer programming. And it's Fortran programming. It's not kind of an obsolete skill now. Right. But in the summer of 1977, it was a useful skill. Um, and so he hired me basically to do programming for him. And he taught me economics to, to, to do my job. And I just learned so much. So here's sort of my first, my first um, sort of role model as an undergraduate. And then I went on for my senior thesis with Alan Blinder. Sure. I'm sort of another sort of great economist, sure, policy maker, Fed the, yes, Fed, Federal Reserve Governor, Vice, Vice Chair of the Fed. I then went to uh, grad school where I studied under first Larry Summers and then um, Stan Fisher. Oh, wow. Stan Fisher advised my disserta PhD dissertation. Wow, yeah. So for those who met, Stan Fisher just stepped down as Vice Chairman, but it's amazing how many professors and people at the Fed you'll meet who had Stan Fisher as a professor. Yeah. And you mentioned Marty Feldstein. I never actually had him as a professor. But I did work for him because in 1982, I took a year off of grad school yeah. and went down to work on the staff of the Council of Economic Advisors. It was a very low-level staffer. I, was, I only had like a year and a half of grad school under the belt. This is point. when he was running it. Yeah, this is when Marty Feldstein was chairman of the, right. of the council. And so he brought some, came, the same Cambridge people down with him. And I was lucky enough to be with a handful of, one of the handful of people who came down working in the first Reagan administration. So then 2003... You went uh, to run the Council of Economic I did. Advisors. I came back as chair, right? And so, let, just to give a people sense, what, where do you sit? What does the head of the Council of Economic Advisors do? Well, my office—I actually had two offices. One, one, one of the one closest to the White House was in the um, old Executive Office Building, the big, uh, I guess now called the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, that sits right next to uh, the West Wing. Um, and what the Council of Economic Advisors is? It's basically a think tank of economists interested in public policy who apply their skills to the pre for the questions that the president would have or the president's staff would have. So you know, I would see the president probably two, three times a week, sometimes just analyzing policy proposals, sometimes just describing what's going on in the data. So when you know, the government sends, announces data almost every day, right? some, some new statistic being announced. We get, at the Council of Economic Advisors, we get the data early. So we get the data sort of 12, 15 hours before the rest of the world does. What, what do we do? We get that data, we, we try to figure out what it means. We write a memo saying, you know, here's, here's, here's the data, here's, what it's, here's, here's how to interpret it. And then that goes to a very small group of people, the president, the vice president, the secretary of treasury, the Federal Reserve chair. So a very small number of people get to see yeah. our analysis of the, of the data hours before the rest of the world sees it. And what was it like to work for George Bush? Oh, I love George Bush. I mean, he's just a great human being. The, and, the you know, I don't, I didn't agree with every decision he made, but that, that's not, that's not the important thing. You don't expect to when you work for a president. Yeah. Uh, but he really created a tremendous loyalty for the people who worked for him because he treated his staff so well. 
Yeah. And he, he took the job really seriously. He, and he knew he was doing the best job he possibly could. And so you, you felt it was an honor really, to work for this person. And what's the most important thing you learned about the government from being in that job that surprised you, biggest surprise? <laughs> I probably should have known this, but it's it's really hard to get stuff done. <laughs> <laughs> that that is a shock. <laughs> you know, in, in the classroom, in the classroom, when you talk about economic policy, it's like <laughs> here's a policy problem. What's the op what, you know we talk about what's the optimal policy? What are the pros and cons of different policies? We decide on the optimal policy, and then once we figure the right, the right policy, we're done. We go on to the next problem. The problem is in Washington, then you only started, right? <laughs> right, because you have to get you have to get things through Congress. You have to convince lots of other people. You have to convince the voters this this makes sense, um, and so there's all sorts of great ideas that never really go anywhere because there's all these political constraints that the president has to deal with, and you became painfully aware of that when you're working in any of these policy jobs. Now, of course, it's frustrating when you're there to have all these constraints. On the other hand, if you step back from it for a minute and you, you realize that these constraints are there for a reason, right? They're called checks and balances. We really don't want a president to be able to do whatever he decides is the best policy. Right. Um, so it's, it's good that we have all these checks and balances, but those checks and balances are going to be frustrating when you're sure you have the right policy. Right. They just, they just, you just have to get it passed. And what's the biggest thing that economists don't understand about politicians? And I'll ask you, what's the biggest thing politicians don't understand about economists? Um, you know, I don't think I don't think economists fully understand the set of constraints that politicians op operate under. I mean, partly because we all we, we all have tenure, so we can say whatever we want. Right. Right. <laughs> so, right. you know, the politicians don't. Um, so they're constantly having to get approval by the voters, and the voters have very different views of economic issues than economists do. And so the politicians are sort of, sort of stuck between the voters who they have to appeal to and the economists who are giving them a set of advice. And so I think understanding the difficult constraints that politicians operate under would be useful. In terms of what politicians could understand about economists, I think they often turn to us for the wrong set of questions. Hmm. I mean, there's um, uh, my, my mentor, Alan Blinder, he, he, I think coined what he calls the Mur Murphy's Law of Economic Policy, which is that economists have the most influence when they know the least, and they have the least influence when they know the most. So, that, so Politicians are constantly asking us, like, what's going to happen next year? <laughs> we're really bad at forecasting. I understand yeah. why they need, people need forecasts. You need, it's part of the policy process. You need to yeah. think about it. But we're really bad at that. We're probably not going to be good at it anytime soon. On the other hand, there are certain problems we kind of understand. Like, we, we, we understand like rent control is not a particularly good way to run a housing market. We understand that if, if you want to deal with um, uh, climate change, you probably want to put a price on carbon. So there's, there's lots of things. If you, have, if you have a city that suffers from congestion, we know how to solve that with congestion pricing. There's right. lots of sort of things we think we have the right answer to, and you get 10 economists in the room, they'll probably all agree yeah. on a certain set of principles. Yeah. But that's not when they turn to us. Yeah, they tend to turn to us for sort of more what are the questions that they think we should know the answer to, but we often don't. How'd you work with the Fed? How, how does the White House and how did you and your job interact with the Fed when you were at the CEA? Well, there's, a, there's a longstanding tradition that the um, three members of the Council of Economic Advisors, the chairman and the two members, would get together and have lunch with the um, the board of governors once once a month. So I, would, I assume they're still doing that. I, I assume today. they are. I haven't, I haven't I haven't asked, but I assume there's some subset of that at least I know that yeah, yeah. is happening. So now. so I think there was a very um, good relationship where we'd sort of get together. Alan Greenspan was Fed chair at mm -hmm. the time when I was there, and so I got to I got to know him. Extremely smart guy, um, and uh, that's, that was a, a sort of ongoing relationship between two institutions. At the particular time I arrived, I actually saw a lot of Alan Greenspan because we were just entering the Iraq War right. in early 2003. And so there was, people were interested in the question of what, you know, what is this going to do to the economy? Is this going to do something to the oil markets? You know, so, so they said we need to sort of pay closer attention to day-to-day -day stuff because it's, we're at a time of heightened uncertainty. So Alan would come over to the White House every day or two days and basically have a meeting with Steve Friedman, the head of National Economic Council, and myself, just, and some staff people, just to monitor what was going on. As it turned out, nothing dramatic happened economically because of the Iraq War, but we didn't know that. Yeah. And so we wanted to sort of monitor that very closely. So I, that was kind of good for me in the sense I got to know Alan very intensely for those, those first few weeks. So at the t end of 2005, you went back to Harvard. I did. Harvard has a strict policy. Two years. Two years. You can go away for two years and then you have to sort of resign your position. Right. And to be honest, I, w I, had, I left my wife at home with 
three small children. So you were go- so yeah. I think my wife would impose a two year rule if, okay. if, if if Harvard if Harvard had not. And I remember Larry Summers did the same thing. Yeah. Later. Okay. Yeah, but I'm still my first wife. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let- Luckily, luckily, <laughs> luckily, there's no press here. <laughs> and then we, we get to just skate right by that. Um, um, when did you write your first textbook? Um, I, I, my first textbook was the Intermediate Macro Textbook, which is sort of a more advanced course. Yeah. And I, when I got tenure at Harvard, which was in um, 87, the chairman said, you know, we need somebody to teach Intermediate Macro. Yeah. Would you do that? And I kind of knew they needed somebody to do it for long term. So I kind of knew this was not to be like a one-off thing. Indeed, I taught that course for the next 15 years. And so I said, well, look, if I'm going to write, you know, write, get prepared lecture notes, you know, how much harder could it be to write my own book? Well, it turns right. out it's a lot harder, actually. <laughs> right. But I didn't know that until I actually sat down to try to do it. But then I kind of learned that I um, enjoyed doing it and the book started selling well. And then as soon as that book started that selling well for that course, then publishers came to me and said, you know, if you think you, you know, you've written it for the intermediate course, you know, 100,000 students a year take um, you know, inter- intermediate macroeconomics. There's a million students here taking introductory economics. Why don't you write a book for that course? That's really the challenge. And so then I, I, I took that challenge up in 1992. So that's after, after the first book came out. And then I so started in 92 and probably came out around 96. And how long, did it take, how long does it take to write an economics textbook? I think each book took me about three or four years. Yeah. And I, I did it just by being very, very consistent, methodical. So I would wake up every morning and just write two pages, two, yeah. two manuscript pages right. a day. So two pages, of, writing two pages is not that hard. And if you do two pages every single day for two years, you have a book. Yeah. <laughs> right? But you got to do it every single day. You can't like, take a week off. You got to nope. do it every single day. So, so I, I, well, I found very interesting. We were, talk, we were talking earlier. We've talked before. And I wrote three books, leadership books, and I thought they sold well. Then I asked you, how many people read every year your books? I sell about a quarter million books a year. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is, yeah, I can't even comprehend that. That's... But I believe you are the most read, these are the most read economics books. Uh, for, for, as of right now. And Paul Samuelson, over the course of his l- career life, that's sold something deal. like 4 million books, I think, over the course. Yeah, that's I, I haven't quite reached that level Incomprehensible. Yet. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for it. Did you, choose a, <laughs> did you choose a specialty early in your career, something well, you wanted to focus in particular on? I got interested in macroeconomics. Okay. Uh, in part because I got a summer internship working at... The and just for people, okay. define, oh, give, macro, your, oh, yeah. give your yeah. definition of macroeconomics. Yeah, it's, it, macroeconomics is the part of economics that's an economy-wide phenomenon. So not studying particular industries or particular firms, but rather studying overall things like the unemployment rate, the inflation rate. This is what the GDP. Fed does. Exactly. This is what the Fed does. So I, I, I originally got interested in macroeconomics because I, I got, as a student, I got a summer internship working at the Congressional Budget Office. Huh. Alice Rivlin was still wow. head of the CB, CBO. Gee. In the 1970s, and I, and, I, and I happened to get assigned. I think this is more coincidence than anything else. I happened to get assigned to the macro group there, yeah. and they just got me really interested in the in the questions of macroeconomics. And so when I came back, I started taking more macro courses. That's when I hooked up with Alan Blinder. Yeah, I took, I took graduate courses from him. He was my senior thesis advisor when I wrote a thesis there at Princeton. Okay, um, and and he's the one who told me to go to to MIT to study with Stan Fisher. And that's and right. That, and that's what I did. So let's go through a few areas uh, of economics, and we'll talk a little bit about later after that about the Fed. So let's let's talk with sustainability, carbon tax. Sure. How many years you've been working on the idea, and why don't you explain the idea to the audience? Sure. The, there's some pro- problems that are in economics that are really hard. Climate change is really not. It, it's maybe hard politically, maybe it's hard scientifically, but the economics is pretty simple. And it really goes back to sort of principles that we teach in introductory economics, which is that markets are usually a good way to organize activities. So supply and demand reaches an equilibrium that's usually a pretty good equilibrium. That's sort of Adam Smith's invisible hand. But if there are what economists call externalities, that are side effects of economic activity, then the market won't reach the right outcome. And the classic example of a side effect is pollution. There's, of course, there's different kinds of pollution, but you know, carbon emissions is basically a particular kind of pollution leading to climate change. So what do you do when you have the side effect? The market's not going to solve the problem on its own because there are there, literally billions of bystanders who are affected by carbon emissions. So what do you do? We need to do what's kind of called internalize the externality. You need to get people in the market to understand the costs and benefits of their decisions. How do you do that? You put a price on those emissions. 
And so the basic idea of, of, of a carbon tax is to put a price on carbon emissions. And it's, it's going to be done at, presumably at the source, and it's going to be done at, say, when, when oil is extracted or when coal is taken out of the ground. But ultimately, it's going to be the price is going to be built into the products, the prices of products that involve carbon emissions, electricity, gasoline, and so on. And that's going to incentivize people to conserve on carbon emissions. It'll, it'll encourage them to move to electric cars, for example, buy more fuel-efficient cars. It'll encourage electric uh, plants to switch away from coal toward uh, more renewable forms of energy. Um, it would basically encourage decisions on both the supply side and the demand side to reduce our carbon footprint. And so that's why, the, um, as was noted earlier, there's a bipartisan group of economists that basically say, yes, the way to solve climate change is to put a price on carbon through a carbon tax. The particular plan that we're pushing takes all the revenue from this carbon tax and rebates it lump sum in the form of what we call a carbon dividend to everyone. So basically take all the money divided by the population and send somebody a check, either monthly or yearly or something like that. The overall plan is progressive because your carbon footprint goes up with your income because people, richer people have bigger houses and more less fuel efficient cars. So, so they're going to probably pay a little more in taxes, in carbon taxes, and then get it back in their dividend. But for people in the bottom two thirds of the income distribution, they're going to be getting more back in their carbon dividend than they pay in taxes. So it's going to incentivize people to reduce their carbon footprint and also provide a progressive way of redistributing resources in the economy. So that's the basic idea that we've been pushing. Um, I've been back to the White House once since Donald Trump was elected. Uh, when, we, 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 when we came out with this plan, it was being led by um, uh, Jim Baker and, and George Schultz um, through a group called the Climate Leadership Council. Um, they, the Climate Leadership Council managed to get us an invitation. And so we went back to the White House. We sat in the, in the uh, Roosevelt Room and pitched our ideas to some of the, um, the president did not show up, but a lot of staff did. Gary Cohn was there, who was head of the National Economic Council, as well as some people from the Council of Economic Advisors. So we pitched our ideas. They asked some questions, and, and they sent us on our way. Um, but I, what, it, what we think we have is a good plan if people decide they want to take climate change seriously. And right now, this president doesn't show any evidence that he wants to take climate change seriously. But I, have, I think if at some point somebody's going to, some president's going to want to. And so he's going to do that particularly when he gets enough pressure from the American people to want to take it seriously. Because ultimately, my view of our politicians is not really our elected leaders. They're really our elected followers. And so they'll do what the American people want. And if the American people want people, want, want, their, want their elected followers to take climate change seriously, there are plans out there that can do it uh, at a fairly low cost way. And so that's the plan that we've, that we've been pushing. And I've been, I've been writing about this for 20 years. Yeah. And I've, I have a whole series of papers going back to the 90s talking about uh, externalities and using corrective taxes to, to, to fix externalities. Um, so the economic idea is a very old one. It dates back to Arthur Pigou, an economist in the early 20th century. But it, the application to climate change is new and, and I think increasingly important now that the science is So as you've worked on this, and you and I have talked before, talked before this, uh, I, I chaired the sustainability yep. effort for the university. How much did you dig into and come up with at least your own personal view as to what the dangers are of climate change? We know, or did I, you not get too far into that? I'm a big believer in the theory of comparative advantage. Okay. And science is not my comparative advantage. So I read the scientists. Um, I try to get a sense from the scientists of what the consensus you is. You at least got familiar with it. Yeah, but I figured I'm not going to be able to sit down and adjudicate okay. the detailed science. Uh, my I think my job as an economist is saying, okay, take this what the scientists tell me as fact, assuming that they're right. What's, what, what, is the, what are the economic implications of that? And then decision makers and leadership have to make a decision. Yes, yes. And you'll help them figure out how to do it. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about trade. Yes. Uh, another thing you've done a lot of work on, and, and, uh, and by the way, Greg teaches, if you're at, uh, at Harvard, he teaches the first year intro, introductory yes, yes, yes. Uh, economics course. It's in a place, I've been there many times, Sanders Hall. How many students? 700? About 700. Yeah. So, and this is, this is the class. This is a small group. This is, by the this, way, this is intimate. By the way, compared, compared to what right, I'm, well, I'm glad we can, I'm glad we can put a small group together and make you feel more comfortable. Um, but Martin Feldstein taught it. Yep. I think Larry Summers yep. taught it. Very prominent uh, people. I think, I think John Kenneth Galbraith. Yeah, way back. I mean, it's amazing. Probably in the same room, yeah, yeah, by probably, the way. Yes, yes. Uh, this is an old building. Uh, what is it you teach your students in that class regarding the importance of trade? Oh yeah, I mean, one of the first things we teach is that base, 
It's like, well, a couple, we see, tra we see, we see trade repeatedly throughout, throughout the course, by, by, by the way. Certain topics are especially important that we en emphasize them early, and then as we get better tools, we come back to them. But one of the first things we study is a theory of comparative advantage, the gains from trade, the ideas that go, goes back to David Ricardo. Why is it we, we, we live in an in interdependent society? And this is not just the theory about trade between nations, which it is primarily, but it's also about trade among people. Why, do, why, don't, we, why don't I make my own clothes and grow my own food, <laughs> right? Trade among people within a society is, is really based on the same principles as trade between nations. And so that's why we start off with sort of comparative advantage as the foundation of economics, because economics is all about li living in an interdependent society. It's not about Robinson Crusoe. So, so we gotta understand what interdependence is about. We then say, okay, well, how does society coordinate trades among people or nations? And then we go into the forces of supply and demand and understanding how supply and demand works, why the outcomes of supply and demand are often desirable. You know, Adam Smith's famous invisible hand leads to good outcomes. Sometimes they're not, they're externalities or market power. Um, and so it, the, to me, the big theme in the first semester, which is the microeconomic semester, is you know, what do markets do well and what do markets do poorly? And try to get students to think about okay, what is the role for government? Um, what is, what, when should government leave well enough alone? Um, and so I, that, that to me is like one of the biggest ideas uh, in economics. And that's why I've, I've enjoyed teaching this course for the past 14 so we'll keep, years. We'll go a little further. So if you're running a trade deficit with a country, is that bad, uh, good? Yeah, what is well, that? You know, what should, what's the, the significance I, of that? I said we keep coming back to trade. We don't do trade deficits in the first semester, but in the second semester, we do macroeconomics. We start doing national income accounting, and then we talk about trade deficits. And so we get, we get back, we come back to trade, saying, well, let's talk about, not just balance trade, but let's talk about trade deficits. In my view is that the emphasis that, that Mr. Trump is putting on trade deficits is deeply mistaken. Um, and I don't think trade deficits, I mean, trade deficits are basically a difference between savings and investment. It has a lot to do with capital flows. And just as a country can be running a trade deficit for bad reasons, but they can also be running it for good reasons. You have to look back on the economic forces at work. And I think the, the idea that you can just look at a trade deficit and say, oh, we're being screwed by the Chinese because we're running a trade deficit with them right. is, 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 just, is just lunacy. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the things, by the way, what we emphasize is that even if you think trade deficits are a problem, bilateral trade deficits, trade deficits between two um, countries are particularly meaningless because trade can be among very, a lot of different countries and you don't, and looking at, at one particular set of transactions is, is, is very limited. I mean, this famous quote from Bob Solo that I like to quote, where he says, Bob, Bob Solo says, you know, I want a chronic trade deficit with my barber. He never buys a damn thing from me, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think of that every time I get my hair cut, I was wondering, do you think I can get my, my, my barber to buy one of my books <laughs> in exchange for the haircut? But no, it's never worked. Um, but, so what's the impact on GDP? And we spent a lot of time trying to do work on this here, and Texas is the largest exporting state in the country. If you have impediments to trade, such as, in fairness, restrictions in other countries, oh, yeah. or tariffs, uh, either, uh, well, I won't say, but you know, if tariffs by anyone, including yeah. us, what are the what's the impact on global trade, and why, is that, why should that matter to us in terms of GDP growth and prosperity. Yeah, I and mean, one, one of the things we cover in the, in the first semester of Act 10, uh, chapter nine, if you have the book with you, um, <laughs> uh, is, you know, is what happens when you know, company, a country opens up to trade? And the basic bottom line is pretty simple, and you can sort of show this pretty analytically with supply and demand curves, but the basic bottom line is that when you open up to trade, the overall economic pie gets bigger. We, 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 we have more prosperity. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody ends up with a bigger slice. So they're winners and losers, right. and some people can end up with a smaller slice, and that's why we need to be very cognizant of that right. and think about the social safety net. It's, right. not, it's, not, it's not like win-win-win for everybody. Somebody can end up with a smaller slice, but the overall pie expands. And so understanding why that is is, is really very important. And what tariffs do, or any other trade restrictions do, is they basically reduce those gains from trade. They basically shrink the size of the economic pie again. Um, and that's why I, I think a lot of the current administration's trade policies, from my perspective, are misguided. To give him credit for one thing, though, I do agree there's one thing, there's one issue that he has focused on to some degree, which is with China. There is a lot of lack of protection of intellectual property in China. I th to me, that's the single biggest right. trade issue. Trade deficit is not an issue. I think the lack of intellectual property protection in China is a big issue. And it's a particularly big issue for the United States, 
because we are a producer of lots of intellectual property, whether it's software or movies or even economics textbooks. You know, we, we sell, we, we produce products that are sold abroad. Right. And um, so we have to, when people don't protect our intellectual property and they sort of steal our patents or when they copy our movies, that's, that's basically akin to theft. It's really not, economics aren't very different than stealing stuff from us. And so I think dealing with that is really very important. Having said that, there's no particular reason to pick trade fights with Europe or Canada, <laughs> because I think those are, those are very different situations. Those are our allies. But I think China, there are some serious issues worth dealing with there. So let's talk about government debt. Uh, another subject, uh, debt held by the public now, I think 77% of GDP and present value of unfunded entitlements is I think up to 54 trillion. And uh, obviously the, wor the dollar is today and hopefully for the world's reserve currency. Yep. And so we seem to be able to continue to finance this. As an economist and in your role, what would be your advice to the country on how we're handling this, these uh, big deficits and Yeah, debt? I'm actually concerned about the deficit, not so much because of the deficit today, but rather the long-term trajectory. Right. And we, we, if you look, we've basically promised a certain level of benefits, mainly Social Security and Medicare to, to the elderly those getting more expensive, especially as the baby boom generation retires. I'm, I'm smack in the middle of the baby boom generation. I'm 61. So I sort of, retirement is on my horizon. When, when, my, when my, me and my friends are all retired, that's gonna be a big burden on the next generation. And the question is how are we gonna pay for that? The way I tell to my students is, and I teach 18, 19 year olds, and I say, look, my generation has promised ourselves these retirement benefits and we <laughs> promised that you're gonna pay for them. How do you, how do you feel about that? And you know, maybe they'll pay for them, maybe they won't. In the long run, my guess is it's gonna be some compromise, some higher revenues, some uh, lower benefits, maybe low, later retirement ages. You know, there's, a, there's a variety of policy levers you can um, adjust, but a large part of it's pretty simple. You know, Social Security basically involves taking money of some, at workers' pockets and handing it to retirees. And if, if, you're, if, you're, gonna, if, if, you're, if you're doing that too, if you promise too much benefits, you either gotta take more out of people's pockets or you gotta give less to the retirees. It's really pretty simple. So there have been some prominent people, Paul Krugman, I'd say, uh, to paraphrase, maybe one of them says, we're worrying too much about these deficits. What do you think about that? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I think he's, he, I think he's particularly was worried several years ago about short-run austerity, especially when that employment rate was Stimulus higher. after the Great Recession, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think he, but I don't think anybody could look at the longer term trajectory, looking at what's going on over the next 20 years and say, ah, no, so, so what if, that the GDP ratio is going off to infinity. I mean, every, we don't know exactly when the turning point's gonna be, yeah. but it's gonna be one at some point. We'll know in hindsight. Yeah, exactly. Right, okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Fed. How would you grade the Fed on how well we've done in terms of uh, normalizing uh, monetary policy? I, I'm actually a big fan of the Fed. Um, and I, don't, I, say that, I say that everywhere, not just when I'm at the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of institutions in Washington, you know, sort of our institutions of public policy that don't work very well, especially right now. And I, I think the Fed is actually one of the institutions that does work, in part because they have a very clear mandate. And it's not the sense that you don't make mistakes. Of course, you, everybody makes mistakes. But you have a very clear mandate. You have people who are committed to that mandate. It's viewed, the, the goal of achieving it is viewed as very technocratic rather than ideological. Right. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, particularly a fan of President Trump, but I will give him credit for one thing. He's appointed very good people to the Federal Reserve. Um, so I think we should really be very, we should be very grateful to him that the, there's a lot of continuity in like Jay Powell and Rich Clarida in terms of what's come before. So I, so I think he's, he's, done, he's, he's done that dimension. He's really done a, a very good job. And I think, so I, I actually think the Fed's, I mean, this is were communications issues back in December and maybe you can mm -hmm. sort of blame the Fed a little bit for what happened in the stock yep. market. But you know, as mistakes go, that was okay. I think you kind of, you, 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 you corrected course. And if you were giving us advice from here, as we're about to meet in a couple of weeks, but in general, what did, would be the number one thing you'd say as an observer, you'd say, you're doing, you're doing okay, but there, this is one or two things I think you really need to focus on from here. Well, I, I think, I, I don't think there's anything I can say that you don't know, which is just to be data dependent. I mean, you know, I'm, one of the big puzzles for macroeconomists like me is why we're not seeing more inflation with unemployment so low. Right. You know, inflation, and the reason you want it to, to normalize is you're afraid oh, if you don't normalize it, unemployment gets so low that inflation will surely take off. Right. And that hasn't happened. And that's right. puzzled lots of macroeconomists. Yeah. And I mean, so maybe the models are wrong or maybe they were wrong for a little while to start being right. 
And so I think you got to be very, you got to be very nimble and very data dependent as things. Data come dependent in. means face reality, try yeah. to understand it. Yeah, and be and be open. Yes, be open. Open to be something. Open, be being open, different. open-minded about what's about what's going to happen, and recognize that whatever your forecast is going to be, it's probably going to be kind of okay. be wrong. And you've written, you've obviously written about the, uh, for the, the, get a little wonky, the Phillips curve, which yeah. is the, you refer to it, is when uh, the labor market is very tight, it should, yeah. the, the, the thought is that will translate into higher wages and then into inflation. We haven't seen that. Yes. And we've, we've got a theory here at the Dallas Fed, we spent a lot of time on that maybe it's technology, technology enabled disruption, globalization to some extent. Do you have a theory on why the Phillips curve is, I guess, in the lingo, flat? I mean, it just no, doesn't I, seem I, to be I, I don't. I don't know. It might be technology, um, but if there were, if it were, if the tech, if technology were the entire thing going on, then you might expect more productivity growth. Right. We, they're, not, they're not experiencing right. particularly. So, so I'm kind of reluctant to go that direction. I, mean, I, I, I still believe in the Phillips curve trade-off. Yes. For, in, in the sense that when the Fed lowers interest rates and stimulates the economy, that's going to tend to lo lower the unemployment rate and it's going to tend to raise inflation over some time, and that says. That there's got to be some trade-off that you're facing. So the trigger might just be at oh, a oh, oh, even a tighter level than what we've seen. Yeah, yet. exactly. But when that occurs, you're going to know it. I mean, another thing that you often hear people say is that uh, inflation's been um, under control because, because expectations are so well anchored. Well, maybe that's right, but there's something particularly vacuous about that because they're yeah. well anchored until they stop being well anchored. How do you know, right. how do you know when that's going to be? Yeah. Uh, and so I, I don't take a lot of solace. In, in, in the, that, 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 that explanation. So one other question, we're gonna take some questions from the audience. What's, you, you meet with lots of different groups. What's the biggest misunderstanding you find about the US economy? When you talk to business people or uh, other, other parts of the government? I think the biggest misunderstanding that people have is that we are incredibly lucky. This is a great economy. Um, we know we have problems. The productivity growth should be nice if we were higher. It would be nice if inequality would start declining rather than rising. Yes. So there are, there are problems we have, but we're still a world-class economy that's creating lots of prosperity. If you are a person living at the poverty line in the United States today, you are richer than 85% of people in the world. Okay? And, and if you think of all the human beings that were ever born, you're probably richer than 99% of human beings that have ever been on this planet. So if I could sort of start marketing a hat, my hat would say, make America grateful again. <laughs> I can't talk to that. All right, let's take, let's take some questions. If you have a question, I guess we have one right here. Uh, step up to the microphone, please. So my name is John Antos. And Greg, since you told us you don't forecast very well as an economist, I won't ask you to forecast GDP for 2019. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll bet it'll, but I bet it'll be under three. <laughs> <laughs> you take real risk, Greg. <laughs> but my question is, you know, we hear about all of the headwinds that were faced, but which of the headwinds do you think are likely to occur? Not the total effect, but you know, what are the headwinds that we talk about that are likely to affect? And I think the group also, Rob, be interested in your answer to that same question. Uh, what are the likely effects? Uh, we won't make you give a forecast, but what are those things you think are really going to materialize? I mean, one of the headwinds I worry about is, is, is how the whole trade war is going to end. I'm hopeful that it'll end a little bit like the NAFTA thing did, although even that hasn't been fully resolved, that's not passed Congress yet. But you know, it, it, it didn't escalate to something beyond, beyond reason. Um, that could change. Um, but that's one, of the, that's one of the headwinds I worry about. I, I do worry about, at, at some point, this inflation might, maybe the Phillips curve will come back. Maybe at some point inflation will, I mean, do you see a little bit of wage growth? So wage, wage inflation has sort of been picking up. One could imagine that might accelerate. If that accelerated, then the Fed will be in a position where they're going to have to be a little more aggressive, and that's going to slow growth for sure. So those are two of the, the things. So I'll give a quick, but I'll do this real fast because I want to hear from, more from Greg than from me. Uh, just so you know, and we do make forecasts, and we have to tell people what they are. Uh, our, our sense is right now, if our base case is that the GMP will grow this year approximately 2%. Um, 
Uh, and I, but I think there's a lot of uncertainty about that number. I think the two biggest concerns we spent a lot of time talking about are structural, aging population, slowing workforce growth. We've managed to pull more people in, but we are getting very tight. Uh, and immigration reform and other ways to grow the workforce could be improving child care, transportation. We've got to find ways to grow the workforce. That's one headwind. The second headwind is we lag the world in education now. Math, science, and reading, we're 25th out of 35 industrialized nations. We're doing better in this country in skill training, but those are the two big things staring us in the face that we like to talk about. We can do something about both of them. Both are headwinds for economic growth. Thank you. And this is of education, which I think is tremendously Please. important. I think education is important for two reasons. One is the overall economic growth, but the other is the best way of dealing with the problem of rising inequality as well. So if you, have, if you think of those are the two big problems, rising inequality and slowing productivity growth, some things will just one and maybe make the other one worse, like high taxes. But education could, is the one that can simultaneously adjust both of them. I think that's very important. Yes, sir. Uh, John Vandermosten with Zach's Research. Uh, even though it's not my industry, uh, I've always been fascinated with energy and kind of its uh, implications. And uh, what, what is your thoughts on the uh, macroeconomic impact of the U.S. now being a energy exporter uh, rather than, you know, importing? I mean, how does that change uh, your, the, I guess, the macroeconomic balance of everything? I think, I mean, the whole fracking revolution has been tremendously important, I think, in turn, and it's it contributed to productivity growth. It does, of course raise the issue of, of fossil fuels and, cl and, cl and climate change, make, makes that even worse. So on the one hand, you have to applaud that, and on the other hand, you say, okay, yes, but this is another problem we haven't fully dealt with. And so it's kind of, a, it's, in that sense, it's a mixed bag. But I don't, I don't even doubt that it's a, it's a plus. It's a big plus, big plus for the economy. And the only thing, other thing we'd add to this, uh, we actually import, we still have, we, we're not energy independent yet. We, so we export, some, some of that is logistics, bottlenecks, uh, certain forms of energy, but we still import, uh, we're, we're a ways away from producing everything we consume. We still import, number one. Number two, used to be that when you had a spike in energy, you'd say it's terrible for the consumer and it's a net negative. Today, because we're more balanced, it's negative for the consumer, but we have an industry and more capex. And it's, so what's happening is it's more muted if you have a price spike because we produce so much more rather than import it as we did, say, 25 or 30 years ago. So it tends to neutralize that impact a bit. Yes, sir. Yeah, so Dr. Mantu, uh, Varun Gupta, Wharton County Junior College in Sugarland, Texas, or we like to say the other Wharton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two questions for you, sir. Uh, first question. You are uh, in the, Texas. <laughs> the first uh, question, sir, is the um, the young lady who you followed into your economics class, did she become your wife? Uh, <laughs> you don't have to answer. Uh, no. <laughs> we dated for several years, and then we broke up. And I won't say who she is, but I will give you a little hint. She's married to a prominent Washington politician now. Ah. I will, I'll let you figure yeah. out who that might be. I didn't know Ivanka <laughs> went to Harvard. Okay. And, and the second more serious question, uh, we talked before the, when we came in, uh, you heard Chair, Chairwoman Yellen's comment to Kai Rizdahl on Marketplace last week when she was asked point blank, do you think President Trump has an understanding of macroeconomic policy? And her answer was very blunt and to the point, no, I don't think he does. And then they asked Chair Powell the next day, and of course he couldn't comment. What would you say to that question, sir? Sorry about I think that. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's mixed. <laughs> I think I I I I, I, mean, it's, it's, I, th I think his understanding of trade is particularly deficient, and I think his understanding of trade deficits is particularly deficient. I think a lot of the rhetoric around trade deficits is basically. I, I hope my students leaving Act Ten wouldn't make those fundamental errors. And then he accomplished something I think is significant. I think the tax bill had some good things and some bad things, but the biggest, the centerpiece of the tax bill was a lower corporate tax rate, and to me that was a good thing. The rest of the world had been mov moving to lower corporate tax rates. We were well above the OECD average corporate tax rate as Trump took office, and he got it down to pretty close to the OECD average. And that was a big step forward. So I'll give him credit for that. I don't want to, I, 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 said, I told, said I'm not a fan of his, but mm -hmm. I want to give him credit where credit where credit is due. So Excellent. thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Kareem Kara, couple, couple of questions for y'all, uh, for both of you. Uh, number one, the ECB just launched stimulus for the third time. 
Um, what is that? How will that affect us? And what does that foretell about uh, the global economy or the global uh, situation? Um, and just to get all the questions, I may I may limit it to one if that's all right with you. Okay, we'll just answer that one. Okay. I don't pretend to be an expert in Europe, but I, I do, when I, when I look at Europe, I'm glad I'm an American, because, we're, <laughs> because our, I think we have, our problems are less serious than they have there, and some of them involve monetary policy, and I think data monetary policy seems in pretty good hands too, actually. I think the ECB seems to be doing a pretty good job. I think the bigger problems there involve some of the populist movements on both the right and the left, things like Brexit in the UK, I think. If, if, I, if, I were, if I were to praying for the UK, I'd be praying for have another vote. Maybe they can make, they can rethink the first vote, which I think that was ill-advised. Yeah. You know, the, the yellow coat, yellow jacket, you know, protesters in France. It's all very, it's all very troubling. Um, most of which the ECB can't particularly address. But I think the ECB is is doing the best they can under the circumstances. You know, on the issue of populism, let me just ask you. There's been a lot of talk about certainly raising the marginal income tax rate in this country in some quarters, but we're also a wealth tax. Yes. What's your reaction to that as an economist? I, I don't. I don't. I think it's a terrible idea. I mean, I think the AOC has proposed a seventy percent marginal tax rate and incomes above ten million a year. Right. Um, Elizabeth Warren, my, my senator, uh, has proposed um, a wealth tax for people over fifty million dollars a year. This is a tax that's going to affect a very, very small sliver of the American of the American people. I mean, something like. 0.01% of the American people are being affected by these, these proposed taxes. And these are people who run sort of big businesses, and, and they, I'm sure they can afford to pay it, but I, don't, I, don't, I just don't think it's a good way to run tax policy. I mean, a lot of these people will, will find ways around it. It's probably not going to raise as much revenue as they think. Um, I think it's an interesting question of how high taxes in the United States should be. I think you can make the case that taxes should be higher in the United States. Yeah. And you look at a lot of Western Europe, taxes are higher there, but they're not higher there because they particularly sock it to the top 0.01%. They're higher there because everybody pays higher taxes there through broad-based taxes like value-added taxes. Right. So if you want, I can I can see the the argument that we want more free stuff, right? The the left's view is we want more free stuff, like free college, free free healthcare, free um, uh, pre pre kindergarten. But if you want if we want to do that, we all have to agree to pay for it. We can't sort of say, oh, um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna give everybody more free stuff, and we're just gonna just tax this 0.01 percent of the population. You know, whenever I hear politicians saying that, I keep thinking about Margaret Thatcher's line, where the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. <laughs> and I think that. That's good. Hi, I'm uh, uh, Mike Davis from SMU. Um, so I think the serious criticism or the serious argument against the carbon tax kind of goes like this, that there's a problem with global warming, and it may be a really serious problem, but it's probably not an existential threat it's going to manifest itself in lower economic growth rates. So instead of doing a carbon tax, why don't we do some other kind of broad-based tax reform uh, that would likely increase growth rates and, in effect, grow our way out of the, uh, the problem of greenhouse gas? I mean, I don't, I'm all for broad-based tax reform to promote economic growth. I mean, that, that's sort of my bread and butter as a... As a as a conservative economist, I mean, so that, that that I'm all in favor of. It's easier said than done, by the way. Um, but um, so I'm all in favor of that. But even whatever whatever tax system we have, whether we get the perfect tax system or the or the current tax system, there's still going to be the side effects associated with carbon emissions, and people are still going to be emitting too much because they're not going to internalize. They take take into account the side effects of their carbon footprint. Um, so. Um, so I think if we put a carbon tax on, people can change their behavior in, in all sorts of ways that won't have a deep adverse impact on, on, on the US economy. You know, I have a lecture I give to my, my, my Harvard students about this. And I go through a bunch of examples. This is back from 2008 when there, was a, when there was a big spike in oil prices. And I started collecting headlines about all the different ways in which people change their behavior. You know, people taking more public transportation, people riding scooters to work rather than their, their, their cars. And my favorite one was um, Sean Diddy Combs, the hip hop mogul, said, you know, I can't take my private jet between LA and New York anymore. I've got to fly commercial <laughs> you know, because the price of the gas is so damn high. Um, you know, so people, I presume he reduces carbon footprint a lot by, by, by taking commercial rather than taking his private jet. So, pe so people at all different levels will respond in a way that's 
probably good for the planet. And I don't think, I mean, yeah, I'm sure it's putting it, put, it will put these, some people out that they can't fly their private jets as cheaply as they, they, they can now. But that's probably an okay thing. So let me ask you a follow-up question, and I'll, I'll bring it home to Texas here. A lot of people don't realize they say you're in Texas, big energy, huge energy producing state. We must not be sensitive to this. And what I found, and I'll ask you about this, because of the hurricane incidents and the intensification of hurricanes, you know, to wit, uh, Harvey estimated cost, we're still 70, 80 billion dollars. Yes. Some of it in reimbursement from the government, but a lot of just wealth loss. We also have drought issues, big agricultural state, we're the largest wind producing state in the country. And it's unusual to interview a energy CEO or supplier that does not think about alternatives. And if you want to supply them, yep. say a Baker Hughes, you can't do it and get the business unless you have a greenhouse gas emission rule. So it turns out there's enormous sensitivity. If you were giving advice, that may not be the popular view, uh, understanding. If you were giving advice to the leadership of the state who's thinking about making major investments in multi-billion dollar investments to, in, in the ports, et cetera, to anticipate that, what advice would you give the well, that's leadership a, that's here? That's a good question. I have, I haven't, Thought deeply about it, but I have one, you know, thought in a speculative kind of way. You know, what 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 can happen if we don't reduce carbon emissions? What happens if cl climate change, instead of being a challenge, a problem, it's just a fact. It's just going to happen. How are we going to uh, adapt? And um, you know, are we going to build walls around major cities in order to keep the water out? Right. Um, you know, maybe there are maybe there are things we can do. Because some people have proposed geoengineering solutions. Hmm. There's one idea that people some people. You know, when, the, when there's a big volcano um, and, this, and sort of certain particles go into the atmosphere, that apparently refl reflects some sunlight and actually cools the pl planet a little bit. Some people have said, well, we can sort of have artificial volcanoes. We can, we can shoot particles into the atmosphere and geoengineer the climate in the United States by, putting, by, you know, by having you know, planes that are going out and sort of releasing these sort of particles that are going to reflect. Mm. Um, to me, that seems a little... Pie in the sky, a little crazy, a little scary, actually. To think we're going to, we're going to geoengineer the, the the globe's planet, but maybe maybe, maybe that's what we'll end up doing. Who knows? I mean, so, so I do wonder. You know, the, the, the difficult thing about climate change is it's something that's going to play out over a very very long time span, and many many things could happen. Um, you know, it's a, I always feel like whenever I think about sort of things over over a you know hundred year span, I think of you know hundred years ago, one of the biggest problems in New York was. The, 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 the uh, horse manure accumulating on the streets, right? Mm -hmm. And technology changed that problem, right? We have other problems yeah. in New York, but not, not, not house without horse manure in the streets. So, yeah. so similarly, it's very hard to sort of imagine what the nature of the problems are gonna be 100 years from now, or the nature of the solutions are gonna be. Yes, sir. Let me pick up this uh, hot potato here, because that's what we do at the Gene Dahl School at the uh, University of Texas at Dallas. Um, you started by speaking about politics and economics, and the hottest potato is perhaps the revenue neutral carbon tax, a proposal that makes perfect economic sense. But whenever I think about it, the words of my second favorite economist come to mind, and this is Danny Kahneman. And he once wrote, in every policy change, there are winners and there are losers, and the losers are going to fight much harder than the winners especially here when the winners are everybody, but the losers are a few individual firms. Do we have any hope for this hot potato to become policy? I, I, I am optimistic um, because, because I think you can do it in a way that there are more winners than losers. Hmm. And I really do think that politicians will evolve quickly once the American people decides they want something to, to be done. You know, I, I have this one slide. When I give my carbon tax lecture, um, I have this one slide that seems completely off topic. It's, it's, it's of the White House the day after, actually the, the evening after, um, the Supreme Court declared same-sex marriage the law of the land. And the Obama administration celebrated this decision by lighting up the White House in the multicolored, like the rainbow flag. And I say, did I say, what is this up to the carbon change? So, you know, here is Barack Obama s celebrating this Supreme Court decision. But did, did anybody remember that Barack Obama ran for president twice on a platform opposed to same-sex marriage? <laughs> hmm. but, his, but, but for some reason, he evolved. His view evolved. Why did his view evolve? Well, the American people evolved. 
And he evolved very quickly once the American people did. And similarly, if the, if the American people are saying, we want a carbon tax, I have no doubt that every politician will evolve very quickly, including Donald Trump. Last question, please. Uh, a few years ago, I had to read a case down the street at SMU about uh, daycare that parents, when charged a fee for being late to pick up their child, were actually more often late than when there was not a fee, being that they could actually pay for the daycare's time to be late. How does the carbon tax not, uh, say, a carbon user can then pay a non-carbon user for the use of that carbon? And in a sense, further, that if the carbon user has to pay X, but gets X plus enjoyment from using that carbon, what makes the carbon user not want to use it anymore? Yeah, I mean, right, yeah, I, I, know, I know that site's a fascinating study, and some people interpret that as saying that, once, that, that prices aren't a good way to incentivize people, to mo motivate people, because once people pay, they won't feel any sense of social conscience. My own view is that as, you, as most people go about their day deciding whether to, you know, where, to, where to live, how, where to take public transportation, uh, what kind of car to buy, some sense of social responsibility is not going to loom large in their minds. They're sort of living their lives. And you really need to give people very traditional incentives. And I think we now have really good evidence that that's the case. You know, it was, I think it was British Columbia that uh, a few years ago put in a carbon tax. And you saw exactly what economists were suggesting, that the carbon footprint in British Columbia went down. In fact, it went down a little more than the economists were predicting. So I think, I think that's an interesting. I know that study. It's a really a very interesting study. But I still think, ultimately, pr prices are the primary tool for which markets and governments provide incentives to people. And, we, and what we have a system now with a price of carbon, which is basically zero, you know, car we can admit carbon at zero price, that's not, that's not the right price. We need to give people the right price so people face, face the right incentives. And so they're, they will make the right decisions without having to appeal to some broader sense of social conscience. So let me ask you one final question. So we've got this, if we could talk for a lot longer and a lot more, uh, but for those in the audience, which are many here, who would like to learn more about economics and want to understand it better and are intrigued by some of the things you've talked about. I have about. a good book to suggest. Yeah, good book. <laughs> so one way is to read your textbook. Is What advice do you give people uh, uh, about if you want to learn about economics and sort of get up to speed, what should they read every day? Or they could read your book. What should they be reading? Or what can they do? I, I, I read, I get three papers every morning. I get the Boston Globe, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. And I think they're, both, they're all three good sources. I used to subscribe to The Economist magazine. I, I, I don't anymore, but that's another great place to, to read good economics. Uh, those are probably, the, I think, that's the best good places. Advice. Greg, thank you for being here. Thank, thank, you. thank you for all that you do. Thank that you very much. Great.